So um, here we are um, um, prepared to talk about the dissolution of the Soviet bloc uh, between 1985 and 1991. Um, in a way, uh, uh, an, an important chapter and perhaps a crucial chapter in our, our story of, uh, of globalism, the story of the globalization uh, slogan, the rise the rise of this slogan and uh, perhaps its fall at the end of the course. So, um, um, so far we've been talking about globalization in terms of um, uh, the fall of the Bretton Woods system, the oil shocks, the Volcker shock, um, all of the um, uh, financialization made possible by the deregulation um, uh, of, um, of uh, financial and other, and other merger transactions. Um, um, by the Reagan administration, the Thatcher administration, and others. Um, and we've uh, been um, you know, talking about the construction of globalization, if you will, or the emergence of globalization in terms of several stages. But I think the thing is incomplete up until now. Um, um, still, we have to deal, uh, no matter how far we've been talking about globalization uh, and the various layers of globalization that we've been describing, um, I don't think we can say the job is really complete until um, uh, we have really um, a no alternative uh, to uh, globalization in terms of an alternate uh, vision of globalism. Um, and um, here we're following Frieden's thought that um, there are really two globalisms, really two systems in the Cold War, and that um, the Soviet side, the Russian side, the Chinese side, the communist side, um, is offering a, uh, another alternative as to how to organize the world economically. And it's represented by Comic-Con in, um, in Europe, the Council of, on Mutual Economic Assistance, which includes all the East Bloc countries, and um, various other arrangements that have been worked out among communists, which are state-to-state -state arrangements and um, are not really based on the idea of the market and a division of labor in the Ricardian sense, the way we've been... Um, the way we've been, de been describing the, um, the capitalist globalization model. Okay, so we do have those two models uh, competing to some degree, no matter how much we can say that on the capitalist side, the globalization uh, uh, um, uh, paradigm has been, um, has been more or less uh, taking, taking root. Um, but here we have a change in all that because one side disappears entirely. So here we have the the disappearance of the whole Soviet model uh, between uh, 1985 and 1991. So not only did the um, Soviet bloc in Eastern Europe um, uh, completely collapse as a Soviet bloc, as a communist bloc, and uh, all those countries adopted an alternative to communism, uh, but we get the same process going on in Russia itself. And more than that, uh, we get the partition of the Soviet Union, partition of the Soviet Union. Uh, into a number of component states, so that uh, <laughs> unmistakably the collapse of the whole core of the communist idea. You can't say the Chinese represent the core of the communist idea. The core of it is in the Soviet Union. So this is a colossal event, and I guess this is the final completion of the globalization uh, paradigm's construction. Or another way of putting that, you could say that um, um, that uh, globalization may have been discarded and may have been laughed off, uh, may have been attributed to the collapse of the capitalist system. I'd said, and that is a uh, an argument that the Soviets were making, the Chinese were making, very very convincing argument that capitalism was going through its death throes. Uh, there were even theories of late capitalism. Ernest Mandel, the Trotskyist. Um, wrote a very influential economic treatise on uh, capitalism, condition of capitalism, pointed to all the things we've been talking about. So this represented a disintegration of the system you know, in its desperate uh, death throes. Late, late capitalism uh, was the model. Um, you might have been thinking that uh, maybe the Soviet uh, uh, way, the other side in the Cold War, was getting the upper hand, certainly politically, certainly in terms of the conquest of territory, certainly in terms of the erection of new uh, worker states, um, you know, communist, new communist uh, states in the, in the world. No doubt, no, no doubting that. Um, but no, but no, that's not the way it went. 
Instead, um, new leadership came to the fore with Mikhail Gorbachev in 1985 in the Soviet Union. They instituted a series of reforms under the slogans of Perestroika and uh, Glasnost. Perestroika means reconstruction. Glasnost means um, expression, giving voice to. It's from the word for voice, gloss, giving voice to. Um, uh, or you might say freedom of expression, that, that, that kind of uh, uh, description. Um, under those slogans, uh, reforms were put in place that eventually led to the overthrow of, of the whole communist system. So my argument would be that globalization was a desperate attempt uh, of a, um, a world economy falling apart and uh, U.S. leadership in the world and not exactly collapsing, but, uh, you know, limping badly up to that time. And then the fall of the Soviet Union reverses everything. And that would be my argument. All of the arguments of Reagan, the arguments of other others in the West about how the whole world is going, how it should be organized, and all the rest of that, they could be regarded as all wet up to this point until the fall of the Soviet Union makes them correct. History intervenes. We're having an argument. We're reasoning things out. Um, we are trying to make everything rational, make everything understood uh, philosophically, historically, all the rest of that. Uh, uh, we think we're doing our best with it. We think it corresponds to reality. But then history comes in. History has a word to say on the matter. And history tells us we're all wet. That we, we're wrong about the thing. You know, we thought we were right. Well, that really is the verdict of the, well, at least it's the temporary verdict. Maybe it'll look differently in 30 or 40 years, but at least um, contemporary, uh, in contemporary terms, that is the verdict that the revolution of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev represents. He makes neoliberalism correct. He legitimizes neoliberalism. Uh, he makes, turns neoliberalism into more than just a, a, a plot of the West, uh, but uh, the verdict of history. So, colossal event, and they may be the biggest event in our story about the rise of globalism. Because it's hard to imagine the notion of globalism catching hold as a slogan, as a paradigm, as a way of looking at the world as a Weltanschauung, as a worldview, um, without the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, the fall of the Soviet bloc means there is no other alternative, no other alternative to the globalization paradigm that we've been, that we've been describing. So I've written on this at great length and <laughs> wrote a big book on it, published in uh, 1998. It more or less survived the reviews. And um, uh, I take great pride in it, although it is, has not not been particularly sensational, has not, does not have a colossal reputation. Although I don't know that there are any books on this subject that have really had a terrific sales and have a wonderful reputation. So uh, maybe it's not so bad the fate that uh, my book uh, suffered. So I'm going to talk to you about a lot of the things that are in my book and some other things uh, today, try to uh, put them into a capsule and um, uh, present them in a very short form so that you can um, uh, you can um, uh, use them as you as you will to uh, um, to apply them to some other things in this course. Um, um, so um, uh, perhaps the first thing we should talk about when we when we um, discuss these things then is the uh, state of the world in uh, 1980 uh, when the uh, when the uh, Reagan administration uh, took power. And, uh, and in the final days of the Soviet administration of uh, Brezhnev, and of course, Mikhail Suslov, who I've mentioned before, the, uh, the brains behind 
uh, Brezhnev, the brains behind the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc, therefore. So up to that time, you could probably describe the world as divided into three parts. Not a globalized world. People used to talk about three worlds. When Mao issued a slogan in 1974, the three worlds theory, uh, he wasn't talking about this map that we're talking about, a different conception of the three worlds. Um, but um, that was the language that one had to use in describing the world. One didn't say one world, the way the whole world is organized under globalism. One wouldn't have put it that way. Uh, you had to imagine the world divided, and not just divided east-west into the two paradigms, as we've been considering it, the way Frieden likes to look at it, um, but politically, not in terms of economic history, but in terms of the political history as three worlds, uh, with uh, you know the, uh, the first world representing what usually is called the West, but which also includes Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and some other places that are not exactly West, Turkey, you know, um, the first world, and then the communist world uh, around Russia, China, and their friends, um, and then a third world, which in many respects um, can be regarded as perhaps leaning, trending generally in the direction of some kind of friendly relationship with the with the communist world, with the central world. At any rate, it's radical about uh, European imperialism. And in the process of throwing off European imperialism, it has had to take various attitudes, which are, you know, more or less consonant with the notions of the communist bloc. Communist bloc is highly anti-imperialist. The United States is even somewhat anti-imperialist, but rather ambivalent, as you can imagine on the topic, you know, since uh, the imperialists are also America's NATO allies. Anyhow, this is our third world. And how can we imagine things going in the third world? I think you have to say that in the third world, or I should say in the three worlds, if we think of it that way, in 1980, uh, the Soviet world is making um, inroads and important inroads. So this map shows that. Uh, it shows the result of the fall of the Portuguese imperial in, imperialism in Africa. So Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Sao Tome, the Cape Verde Islands, uh, they're all slipping over into the socialist camp. They all have dictatorships of the proletariat. Um, and then we have some other regimes, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, South Yemen, Cuba, uh, some regimes in Central America that don't show up so brightly on this map, Nicaragua, there's a war being fought in Salvador. Um, so quite a few outposts, quite a few penetrations, you could say, of the, of the third world uh, made by the communist system. In fact, looking at it, this in the long run, I mean, this map compares the way things are in 1980 as opposed to the way they are in uh, 2017. But if we uh, juxtapose a third map on top, which I don't have handy, but <laughs> imagine it in your mind's eye, third map going back to 1945, we might say that um, Soviet uh, bloc is the one that has broken uh, broken containment. Those who argue that the Soviet Union fell on account of the successful application of containment, and that is to say, in the long run, one ought to understand the fall of the Soviet Union as a victory of containment. I've never, never, never bought this line and argue very earnestly against it, although there are some people who argue it. Um, and I would say uh, containment up to this time, 1980, uh, has been a failure, as you can see on this map. Uh, if you drew a line, containment line around the Soviet bloc, that is to say the bloc around Russia and China, and you imagine the military alliances and encircling this bloc, NATO, CENTO, Baghdad Pax, CETO, all the various contrivances, um, and you imagine that as a line of containment, it hasn't held in uh, the Soviet bloc, as of 1980, that is, it hasn't held it in. No, obviously not. Um, not only does the third world not want to regard itself as part of a containment ring around the Soviet bloc, it does not, and that is indicated very clearly from the time of the Bandung Conference in 1955 and continues, you know, in third world anti-Western nationalism, or I should say anti-imperialist nationalism. Um, but also, uh, there's actually been a penetration of the communist idea. 
So these uh, red blotches represent the communist idea. So um, I think I would say uh, quite the contrary. Um, the fall of the Soviet Union, not the result of containment. Uh, by the time the Soviet Union fell, containment had been breached, I, uh, as I like to put it, on three continents. On three continents. So you could say containment's been a failure. In fact, I would say that. I'm not sure I'd be speaking for a consensus of historians, but I'd, be, I'd definitely say, say containment has been has been breached on three continents. So it, you could argue then, in view of this, that the um, Soviets, uh, imagining themselves to be the center of this um, world revolution, um, oh, and I could have included the Portuguese revolution right in Europe, uh, at least for a time in 74, 75, it looked as if it was establishing a dictatorship of the proletariat right in Europe. Um, but anyhow, um, if you looked at it from the Soviet point of view, they don't have the feeling that they're trapped rats. They don't have the feeling that their system is not working. They don't have the, the notion that somehow they're retreating before the West. Quite the reverse. <laughs> they're completely full of themselves. You read all the documentary material from the period, and uh, you'll be absolutely convinced of that. They uh, think they're marching from one triumph to another for good reason. The Sino-Soviet split that is developing very sharply among them can be regarded as a kind of a, um, a result of that. You know, um, in victory, the victors are falling out among themselves. Um, the same way the victors fell out after winning World War II in 1945. So I would argue that the Soviets were not, not trapped, not feeling that their system was stagnant or... Um, or failing or anything like that, um, but quite the reverse, were um, absolutely full of themselves and wondering uh, how what to do next and what to do with their victory, how to, how to shape up uh, what was looking like their big victory over the West. Um, and uh, if anything, uh, rather than a feeling of uh, defeat and, uh, and uh, dejected uh, um, uh, sensibility, uh, you could say there was a kind of ar arrogance in the Soviet position. Um, not, I read that literature very carefully when I was doing research for the book, and uh, uh, it's unmistakable how, how uh, confident uh, the uh, Soviet literature was, how confident their intellectuals were. After all, they could say that they had uh, missile parity with the West, and the West had not wanted to give them um, a, a, the SALT agreement, but the missile parity actually, actually, actually fall, forced it on the West. This was certainly the argument. Uh, that um, in 1969, they, they had a rough parity with the United States and uh, you know, the West had no alternative than to uh, sign the SALT agreement. So arms control was in effect uh, imposed upon the United States. They had, of course, all their new victories for the revolution. These are uh, perhaps more Fidel Castro's victories than Soviet victories, but their victories, the Soviets could, could argue, um, victories for the communist idea. Uh, capitalism was reeling globally. They could say, look, the gold standard's falling apart. They don't know what their money is worth. Their allies have turned against them. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, they are inflicting oil shocks on the, on the world, and, um, and they've inflicted this financial tyranny on the world through the Volcker shock. Uh, the, wor the world is um, reeling. The capitalist world is reeling uh, in this uh, Terminal crisis, you could say. Terminal cri In fact, the main problem for the Soviets, it might be argued, and Roy Medvedev made the point exactly this way. Uh, Roy Medvedev, a dissident, a uh, very intelligent dissident, wide, widely read dissident historian, uh, made that made exactly this argument. The Soviets were trying to see how they could take advantage of this decay and decline of late capitalism. Uh, and perhaps even sort of taking out loans. Uh, capitalists are hawking these loans all over the world, maybe the East European regimes. Um, can solve some of their problems in the production of consumer goods by taking out loans uh, in, in, in the West. So and that's the sort of, how shall I put it, that's the, that's the arrogance uh, and the, uh, I don't know, confidence, uh, extreme confidence that they had um, uh, during this period. And the attitude, I think, was not so much that we're in trouble, uh, we have to adapt. Well, I think it was uh, they're in trouble. And uh, we have to take advantage. And, uh, you know, we probably can take advantage without much difficulty. Lenin told us that um, 
these capitalists, uh, they will sell you the rope uh, with which to hang them, uh, that uh, they are absolutely craven, cannot stick to one policy, capitalist powers cannot stick to one policy against us, that uh, they will split up, uh, that uh, uh, they will um, uh, take the attitude of sauf qui peut, you know, save what you can, every man for himself, because they're capitalists. They will sell you the rope with which to hang. And this was the Lenin's admonition. You saw it popping up in um, Soviet literature, including Medvedev. Medvedev quoted Lenin on that, uh, talking about taking out loans um, for the East European, the East European powers. Uh, so this is the mood, you know, very, very arrogant. But of course, there was a reason for caution at the time. Um, I mean, not economic caution. I mean, in this graph, you can see that the Soviets are uh, marching from victory to victory. They haven't gone, they're not going through a period of economic stagnation, at least not in some kind of general terms, such as a measurement of national income, measurement of gross domestic product. It's marching from victory to victory. You see that we go forward right up until the end of the Soviet Union, and then almost exactly when the Soviet Union ends, but not exactly, just a little bit before the Soviet Union. That is to say, when the Gorbachev reforms start to take effect, <laughs> that's when you see the massive decline. Then, of course, when they restore capitalism, it's nothing but decline. Shock therapy, they are absolutely, we'll talk more about that on another occasion next time. That'll, that'll be part of the next topic when we talk when we talk about how the spoils of the Soviet Union were distributed. We'll talk about shock therapy. But um, the, the descent of the, the graph, uh, shown here in blue, um, uh, in the 1990s, you uh, see that uh, indicated fairly clearly. That's uh, something that happens after the fall of time. So this does not, this graph does not tell the story <laughs> of a Soviet Union which is declining uh, economically and which is in big trouble. They certainly have got more warheads and more nuclear weapons than the United States. They kind of worked it out in all the SALT agreements that uh, they still retain a considerable edge um, in um, numbers of warheads. So take a look at it for uh, 1980. It's rough parody in 1980, but by the time you get to the end of the Gorbachev regime, um, they've got a rather considerable, I don't want to say superiority, but they've got a, a, a numerical edge. Not that these things mean anything. Now, nobody's going to actually use them in, in a big war, uh, but they have a kind of symbolic and, how to put it, uh, emotional kind of um, uh, importance for the uh, uh, person who considers them. Um, and this all owes to uh, something we've talked about. No, actually, we didn't talk about it, but maybe I could have talked about it. Uh, when discussing the 60s and 70s, the fact that the United States, uh, when it reached the level of around a thousand warheads in the 1960s, that's right about here, um, uh, said more or less that uh, 1054, that was the number they arrived at, quite arbitrary, 1054 would be the number of uh, warheads they would, uh, or excuse me, the number of launchers that they would, uh, that they would stay at, and so they're going to stay on this line, 1054, waiting for the Soviets <laughs> to, uh, to catch up. So they get here, they wait, they're waiting for the Soviets to get, and then they catch, the Soviets catch up, and then they continue uh, along this line. And you see that uh, by the time we get around to um, SALT 2, which would be about there, you know, maybe a little further to the left, about there, um, uh, the Soviets have something like a three to two superiority in these weapons, and and the uh, and the superiority they have, not superior, numerical edge they have, um, has to be offset um, by uh, uh, by American superiority in other fields. Um, Kissinger called this offsetting asymmetry. So the, there's an asymmetry in ICBMs in long-range missiles, that is to say, these in a, Soviets have the edge there, uh, but uh, we have the edge in sub-launched uh, missiles and, uh, and in bombers. And so uh, this roughly balances out. It's parity according to asymmetrical, um, or I should say offsetting asymmetries, Par parity according to offsetting asymmetries. 
Um, and so all that looks good. And, and you know, uh, one of their most important intellectuals, certainly the, one, one of the most celebrated intellectuals, Alexander Bovin, um, he kind of summed all these things up in terms of a long march of the Soviets to a position of superiority over the West. Um, I had occasion to talk with him at great length uh, in a conference uh, that uh, um, that I attended uh, during these years, during the years of the, during the Gorbachev years, and I got a real picture of um, how he laid the whole thing out. He's a very very articulate fellow, wide knowledge of all the questions having to do with weapons strategy. Um, geopolitics, and he was the guy uh, in many ways in the Soviet press. Um, and the way he put it, uh, he said, uh, he said the uh, United States uh, stopped history when it invented the A-bomb. And uh, at the end of World War II, the Soviets were so overwhelming, certainly so overwhelming on the world island, that they certainly could have spread the revolution anywhere they wanted at the end of World War II, except for the fact that the United States had nuclear weapons. And these nuclear weapons made the Soviets step back. For five years, they didn't have those weapons themselves. And so there developed a certain feeling that they were behind the Americans and still had to be caution, cautioned and, and uh, et cetera. So history was stopped, the way Bovin liked to put it. History was stopped in 1945. The Soviet achievement of missile parity, however, in 1969, had started the historical clock uh, moving again. So, so that's the way they looked at it. Um, and Ronald Reagan, he represented a kind of a note of caution with this massive arms buildup, especially with the threat of the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, the Star Wars Initiative. Um, it, even if it never worked, and it never has worked, exactly, um, even if it never worked, it certainly would be a big expenditure of money that the Soviets maybe would have to match and in a way the United States would drain the Soviet Union of resources by forcing it into this arms race and maybe it would uh, um, in effect um, um, be a representative of a or should say be a a, a tool in the in the American exhaustion strategy. At any rate it was the way Gorbachev described it a good deal when he first came to power in 1985 that the United States was pursuing a strategy of exhausting so, but he kept saying, you won't exhaust us. Uh, um, uh, no matter what you spend, uh, it, you won't exhaust us. For one thing, um, if, even if you do set up this magnificent um, SDI, this missile shield, presumably, all we have to do is punch a little hole in it. <laughs> all the same technology <laughs> that goes into the missile defense system that's up in the heavens, um, uh, all the same technology can be used by ASAT capability, anti-satellite. So no matter what you put up there, uh, we still have the capacity to put something else up there. It'll punch a hole in it. And through that hole, uh, we will throw or threaten to throw uh, new numbers of missiles, enormous numbers of, of missiles. Um, and so in effect, quantity will overwhelm this, this thing. You know, you can't catch everything. Deterrence still, still matters. We can't say that the era of mutual assured destruction is no longer, uh, no longer uh, uh, in operation, no longer extant. Um, okay, so those are all the things that the United States was thinking about and dealing with Ronald Reagan and with his arms buildup. And in addition to that, uh, Reagan had also brought into being something called the um, the National Endowment for Democracy, and here under Carl Gershman, its longtime uh, leading light. And this National Endowment for Democracy supervised a number of uh, supports, uh, um, financial support and moral support to a number of, of uh, organizations of every kind of poli politics. Um, that were anti-Soviet, that did something or other somewhere in the world against the interests of the Soviet Union or the other worker states. Uh, so that this represented a kind of a global anti-communist international, the Soviets thought of it as. Um, and the, this all came to being in 1983, 
same year as the Strategic Defense Initiative. And this got more, probably more attention, Soviet press, than the Strategic Defense Initiative because it meant the Soviets would have to pay more or support more um, to new radical states. And, uh, you know, these include, include Cuba, of course, um, uh, new radical states uh, to fight this or that uh, insurgency uh, that might be supported from Washington. Um, now these were all these were all things that really, how, how to put it, they represented cautionary notes to the Soviets. I wouldn't say they were overwhelming. I don't think they're any more uh, than a, kind of a caution and a, uh, a suggestion of a perhaps small problem to be contended with, uh, but certainly not the idea that, well, this means communism's all over and we have to partition our whole state. No, did not, did not suggest those things. It, so it is still very much convinced that they're in the driver's seat. Um, okay, so why is it that the Soviet Union collapsed then? If it was on top of everything, as I'm saying, if it wasn't in any economic trouble and wasn't really in any geopolitical trouble, well, at any rate, not certainly not a terminal geopolitical problem. Uh, and why did it collapse the way it did? I would attribute this to the world historical dilemma of the communist idea. Now, hey, very pretentious phrase. But here's the world historical dilemma of the communist idea. Um, Marxist socialism is a product of the adva most advanced countries uh, in Western Europe. And its whole doctrine is built around the notion that the most advanced will take up Marxist socialism. So they will rule from the top. So if the revolution had occurred in Germany, for example, as Marx and Engels fully expected, uh, they imagined it would probably be imitated in some way in, in England, in Holland, maybe in the United States, anywhere there was democracy, they thought. Uh, the workers would eventually be enough, have enough votes to vote themselves into power. All right, so that's the picture they had in the 19th century. Now, all that is upset by World War I, by an enormous imperialist crisis. You could say that uh, Marxist socialism in the 19th century underestimated the uh, profundity and depth, well, those are the same thing, aren't they, uh, of the... Uh, of the crisis of imperialism, of the contending imperial states all over the world, and the fact that they were going to get into a big war, going to have it out. And in having it out, of course, that they, in effect, crippled imperialism, as uh, subsequent decades were to demonstrate. Um, so this, this dilemma consists in the idea that it was in revolt against the imperialist war of 1914-18, when the Russians mutinied against the war, it was that that created communism, not the emergence of the West European proletariat behind Marxist and socialist ideas. Although they may have got the upper hand in some other more subtle way uh, within the framework of democracy, and of course, they would have been corrupted in various ways. You have, we also have to consider, because we do know that the history of the Socialist Democratic Party is that they're, they have constantly given ground ideologically over the last century or so um, uh, uh, to their um, capitalist, uh, or I should say to the, uh, the people who they criticize, the capitalists who they criticize. Um, nevertheless, uh, it didn't happen in Germany or in an advanced country. It happened in Russia, a pretty advanced country, but not really, um, a country that's both advanced, pretty advanced in the industrial sense, but still maybe 80% peasant at the time. I had to say an agrarian country, a very backward country at the time of the revolution in 1917, which, as I stress, was a, um, um, a revolt against imperialism, uh, a, re a revolt, a mutiny. That's really all. And that's, it. And that's the reason the Bolsheviks got power. I don't think the Bolsheviks would have got power had it not been for the war and for the mutiny against the war. So Bolshevik revolution is a mutiny against the war. Since the war is an imperialist war, it's a mutiny against imperialism. 
that was understood from A to Z, I think, by the leaders of the new communist state in the early days of the revolution. They were not under any illusions uh, about that. The growth of the proletariat in Russia was considerable, but it wouldn't have been enough to take them to power. They needed this peasant war in the countryside. They got the peasant war on account of the war, and they needed this mutiny in the army. And the proletariat through the Soviets got influence over the army, and that's how they got power. So in a way, the socialist idea is not going according to the path that Marx cut out for it, Marx imagined for it. Russia is a pretty backward country, and yet, backward as it was, getting hold of a country as formidable as Russia with the formidable possibilities of Russia, and they're already uh, semi-industrialized. Uh, Count Vita in the 1990s, um, under the Tsarist regime, had, had industrialized the country, had built railroads and big factories and uh, quite a bit of industrialization. Really, they only completed the industrialization under the communist system, under Stalin and the five-year plans in the 30s. Nevertheless, quite backward, as Lenin kept pointing out to them, a very, very backward country so that's holding out against the more sophisticated countries. It's not according to the Marx, the Marx picture. Um, but nevertheless, even under those conditions, the fact that they organized what they called war communism, that is to say, organization of the country down to the details for war uh, during the Civil War and Allied intervention when 14 nations intervened on Soviet soil to try to destroy the revolution and were defeated militarily. So it's very, very formidable military accomplishment, war communism, they called it. And then industrialization of the country pretty much according to the same scheme, war communism to collectivize agriculture, to put into being a five-year plan, to force it on a population that uh, may not have wanted to do it, to do all those things, this tremendous prodigy of, uh, of war communism. Uh, and it turned out to have the greatest test when the Nazis, when the Nazis attacked it, and it won that battle. So it imagined that if there had been, is it, and there's a post-communist text that puts it exactly this way, if this was a test posed to the Soviet Union and the Soviet system by world history, the Soviet Union had passed the test. Powerfully put, I think, bearing in mind that these people are post-communists you know, who write a textbook like that. But I think that's perfectly correct to say that. Um, uh, it was a kind of vindication, if you will, of the five-year plan, the way, certainly the way Stalin described it in 1946, a vindication of the uh, five-year plans that they defeated, defeated Hitler and did the world, of course, a great, great favor, the biggest favor it's ever, it's ever got. <clears throat> all right, it did all those things. A tremendous prodigy of defense of the country, of defense of the communist idea, uh, and done in league with the most progressive nations in the world, as the Soviets think of it, you know, together with the British and the United States, you know, in a certain sense, the French and the Poles, all the more progressive countries, all with them, this great, great victory. Um, what did that mean exactly for the, for the communist idea? Uh, did that mean that it was, it had overcome its backwardness? Now the Chinese started to kick this idea around uh, in a serious way uh, during the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. Um, Marshal Lin Biao, the uh, military sidekick of Mao during the Cultural Revolution, shown here on the right in this, uh, in this uh, picture, uh, Lin Biao um, offered a theory to the effect that um, the whole world was going to go communist because uh, all of the countries around the advanced capitalist West uh, were going to turn against it become communist, and the um, hinterland of the world, the agricultural, rural hinterland of the world would close in on, um, on the industrialized modern world, 
which remained capitalist, and that's how the world would go socialist. What on earth would Karl Marx have thought of this idea? I mean, it's, it's absolute negation of, of Marx and Marxism. Well, you know, Marx was certainly a revolutionary. Maybe Marx would have said that, you know, in the name of the revolution, I have to revise just about everything I've thought. Who knows how Marx would have felt about that. Anyhow, it's quite a whopper of an idea for a traditional Marxist who has actually read some Karl Marx. <laughs> it's a whopper of an idea that the uh, most backward places in the world are the, going to be the places that adopt the idea of, uh, of uh, socialism. It's not, Marxism is not based on this idea. It's a kind of a reverse idea. Only the most advanced places are going to adopt. This is the historical dilemma of the, uh, of the communist, communist idea. And uh, so what is the ramification of this within the world of the countries that have gone communist and are modernizing? One of these days are going to be modern. Are they going to have a system based on the peasantry? Are they going to have a, how to put it, some kind of Jacobin kind of agrarian sort of egalitarian sharing out Jeffersonian, I don't know what to call it exactly, some kind of Jacobin model, not a Marxist model. Or are they going to genuinely modernize as they get urban populations? They're going to act like a modern country according to Marxist theory of the 19th century. Are they going to become democratic? That's the whole thing. So a Marxism, in the end, does not negate uh, democracy does not cannot be a substitute for democracy. Uh, Marxism, socialism has to be democratic in order to be properly such. That that's what I would call the historical world or world historical dilemma of the uh, of the communist idea, kind of shown in a certain ironic way in this poster, which imagines a Soviet poster, which imagines all the different peoples of the world, different genders, different races, different peoples of the world, joining hands, world proletariat under the slogans of peace, uh, dem democracy, and socialism. So the idea of democracy cannot be this. You cannot say Soviet Union has figured out a way that is even more wonderful than Western democracy, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we don't have to have the people vote uh, or determine the leadership uh, by a democratic vote, the way Marx imagined. We don't have to do that because of our Soviet experience, blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. In the end, and this is, I guess, my final point in the paragraph, uh, the question of democracy could not be evaded. The Soviet Union was going to have to become democratic. So that's the whole problem, the whole dilemma. And what emerges alongside that dilemma, or I should say the form in which that dilemma, the substance of that dilemma presents itself historically, is the problem of a, a democratic statecraft for socialism. In other words, the socialists have mastered the state as a dictatorship, a party dictatorship, a one-party dictatorship, and a rather grinding one at that, to say the very least, and uh, now they have to master that state as a democracy. You think that's an easy thing? That one just blows the whistle and says, oh, we're all going to be Democrats now? Far from it. If it were the case, Xi Jinping and the Chinese communists would have solved this problem a long time ago. No, it's terribly, terribly involved problem. We don't even understand all the dimensions of it. Uh, because it hasn't unfolded for us historically. But that's the dilemma. That's the whole dilemma, a, a democratic statecraft for the idea of socialism. That means not only that they have democracy, but they still can run a state among a world of states, which is not, necessar not necessarily hostile, but not necessarily friendly either, which uh, marches according to its own national interest. Um, so that's, that's the problem.
that's the problem they had. And um, the way the Soviets imagined the thing, um, they were going to have to get back to some kind of regime of detente. They knew detente had been exploded at the end of the 70s when the SALT II agreement was not ratified by the American Senate. Um, they wanted a continued arms control regime, and now they didn't quite have it. They knew they had to have this. Nobody wants a nuclear war. Can't allow a nuclear war. But to get back to this detente, no matter what's going on in the world politically, no matter what the relationships with the capitalist powers is, uh, we have to get back to this detente relationship. So said the most experienced, most seasoned um, of the Soviet diplomats, Andrei Gromyko, who had been with Stalin, had been with a number of different regimes. Nobody had more prestige in the handling of diplomatic, geopolitical, foreign problems than world historical problems, you could say, uh, than Gromyko. And um, certainly uh, the person to whom all the other leaders looked. Uh, and in fact, he played a big role in getting Gorbachev elected to the leadership in 1985. Uh, maybe without Gromyko, Gor Gorbachev, Gorbachev wouldn't have made it. The leadership probably might have fallen to this man, head of the Leningrad party apparatus, Grigory Romanov. Um, not a dope. Not a uh, not a mediocrity by by any means, and in fact a person with a sort of stern kind of moxie and uh, and a certain reliability and all the rest of that tied very closely to a general by the name of Nikolai Ogarkov, who had just re written a volume called um, um, uh, Socialism Demands Vigilance. Demands vigilance. In other words, a military book. Military people occasionally write books like this. You know, uh, there are this big military problem we've got to solve. Otherwise, we're everything's cooked. And uh, basically, what Ogarkov was saying was uh, the West and these Reagan arms build-up measures, SDI things of that sort. They represent a challenge, and uh, we've got to eat fish heads for a while. <laughs> That's essentially this point. Maybe I'm putting it too strongly, but we've got to tighten our belts a little bit. Not much, but a little bit uh, in order to keep up with the West and all of its tricks. Remember, it's in its death throes, so it's going to try everything in the world. It's a wounded animal. Um, and that really has to be the way we have to frame our economy. So there's no vision in the thinking of Ogarkov, who was thought to be perhaps the most important person behind Romanov, no, um, no vision in these people's thought um, for any kind of big changes in the Soviet Union. And the Soviets still would like some changes. What they would have wanted was democracy. I think all the communists, if you caught them, you know, if you administered truth serum to them, they would all have to admit, they, of course, our idea is democratic and we want to be a democratic country. We'll never feel uh, that we're, no matter what we do in the way of revolution, we'll, we'll never feel that we're, we've really caught up with the West and let, until we're a democracy, until our people have the sense of a democratic freedom as defined in the West by Western definition. Uh, there's no vision as to how to achieve that uh, among these people. And uh, it's no accident that the leaders turn elsewhere uh, to Mikhail Gorbachev, a man without a great record, um, but a very, very smooth and, uh, what's the word, a genteel person, maybe more genteel, um, more cultured, the Soviets like to say, called Tordini for this kind of idea, meaning a more smoother character uh, than uh, the rest of their, uh, the rest of the people that might have been an alternative. Um, uh, and might have uh, arisen to the leadership. So uh, that was really the attraction of Gorbachev. And uh, the opponent of Gorbachev, who emerged immediately, and this was something they had to do, they um, set this up this way, and it is the system they operate under. It is the system of Leninist uh, collective leadership. They were not uh, making Gorbachev a king or a Stalin, anything like that. 
there was going to be a, um, an ideological secretary, a second secretary uh, in the Politburo. And here, he, here he is, Yegor Ligachev, who had uh, spent, uh, I think, uh, over a decade in Omsk uh, in, the, um, in the Soviet uh, Siberia, uh, really in the sticks. Um, for a long, long time, but loyal, loyal, trusted leadership, trusted leader, is going to take up the position that Mikhail Suslov had taken up. Um, remember, Suslov is the one who got rid of Hrushchev in 1964, organized everything to get rid of Hrushchev, so you can imagine what that means. And he set up the brezhnev kosygin leadership, which turned into the uh, Brezhnev leadership, First among equals, stability of cadres, they said. In other words, uh, no big purges, driving people in and out of power, accusations, squabbles, none of that. Uh, regime of stability run by uh, Suslov under this collective leadership and Leninist norms, that's the way they would put it, Leninist norms of collective leadership. Uh, in other words, a certain restraint on the boss, the big boss. Uh, so that's just the Suslov system, and Suslov died in 1982, along with Brezhnev, same year. So they didn't have a Suslov. This is their Suslov, uh, Yegor Ligachev. Difficult thing, and it turns out the Suslov system couldn't hold up. The collective leadership couldn't hold up because um, Gorbachev was constantly fighting against it. So every time Gorbachev tried to introduce something new, uh, the leaders would bristle at it and want to compromise with it. Um, at Reykjavik, when he was talking about doing away with the SDI in his discussions with Gorbachev, they all bristled at this and wanted to put restraints on him. And he decided at that time, and this is in January of 1987, that he was going to fight them. And um, when he decided to fight them, he was going beyond the Suslov system, or as they would have put it, Leninist norms. He was violating Leninist norms. And going down the path, I mean, not saying he was already there, but going down the path to personal dictatorship. So I described this period by calling him a good stall. In other words, he's fighting in a succession struggle to get the leadership, uh, but it's not collective leadership. It's going to be around his person. It's going to be personal leadership. It's not going to be like Stalin. He's not going to throw everybody in camps and do things like that. But uh, he is going to be a personal, personal leader. So there's the problem. There's the problem. So they have got lots of reasons for opposing him. The more they oppose him, the more he tries to beat them down. Glasnost, Pirstroika, um, Democratization, those emerged as uh, slogans. Destalinization emerged as slogans largely to beat down his opponents, uh, to beat down that leadership. This is kind of foreordained uh, by the failure of the Leninist norms, so to speak, the failure of the Suslov system. That's the institutional reason uh, why things fell apart. So they had to come through this personal dictatorship. Um, and I guess the, the sign that all the worried communists in the leadership who were afraid that Gorbachev was going to take them too far, the, the thing that really shook them up was when Gorbachev came out against them and said he advocated um, universal human values instead of class struggle. Um, he said everything should be based ideology, ideologically on universal human values. Uh, um, all human, what would you call it? All general human humanism, or something like that. <laughs> Not class struggle. Uh, it came to be a kind of a shibboleth, a kind of a signal. Um, with the Soviet leaders, you could tell whose side they were on in the struggle that was going on in the Soviet Union. That's, well, are you for all human values? I remember doing this with a couple of Soviets that I met in those days. Um, one guy who was trying to psych me out in some weird way, uh, representative of TAS, so-called, I think he was something else. But anyhow, uh, he, uh, he was asking me who, you know, how to size up all the leadership in the United States, of all people, he would ask me uh, who 
how to size up the leadership in the United States. And uh, I asked him uh, in return, are you for universal human values or are you for class struggle? Me, which do you think is the one principle according to which the Soviets have to march? And he said unhesitatingly, he recognized exactly what I was saying. He said unhesitatingly, universal human values. And I knew he was with Gorbachev and uh, not with Ligachev and Gorbachev's opponents. So that's the way things went there for a couple of years. Gorbachev um, uh, pushed them a little further than they wanted to go, although they didn't mind it. They liked his leadership. Everybody liked his leadership for a while. They just weren't sure where it was going, but they liked it. So he went back into negotiation with Ronald Reagan, set up the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement in 1987, conducted still more talks with Reagan's successor, George Bush, um, in December of 1988, decided to take 500,000 troops out of East Europe. Wow, big moment. I was on a radio show with Alexander Dolan um, at Stanford, um, who was, I thought, the biggest academic expert, most important, most influential academic expert on the Soviet Union. Um, and they asked us both, uh, what did we think of this measure of Gorbachev's to take all these troops out of there? And we both said exactly the same opinion. We both said, oh, it means he's a world statesman of the first order. Oh, you know, in other words, we're, we're very impressed uh, by this measure of Gorbachev. We thought it was very, very clever. It meant he had the upper hand. He was determining everything. And by this strategy of concession, oh, it's a very clever strategy, we thought, of concessions. We thought the Soviet Union was so strong that these concessions were really going to undermine the United States. And, and Gorbachev put it ex exactly that way. He said, uh, the more we eliminate the Soviet threat, uh, the more we undermine the Cold War. Uh, and it was working. It was working. Um, he was more popular uh, than uh, Reagan or Bush in American polls. People were in love with him. It was a cult. Not in, not in the right places, but <laughs> a cult at any rate. Uh, outside the Soviet Union of, uh, of Gorbachev, how brilliant Gorbachev was there. So anyhow, we came over this broadcast after having praised him, and I was shifting into second gear, and it occurred to me, that's not right. I'm all wrong about this. This is going to end up in the end of the so whole Soviet Union. They're, they're all going to get overthrown, and the communists are going to end up hanging from lampposts, I said to myself. I remember uttering this thought to myself in the car on the way home, December 1988, when it finally dawned on me. <laughs> my, my mother would said a brick wall uh, had to fall on you <laughs> for you to see how this thing was going to end up. Perfectly right. Anyhow, um, they did take their steps back. They did disarm the arms race. Reagan was one to Gorbachev. His leaders, I mean his um, advisors, including Henry Kissinger, all said this was a trick of Gorbachev's. You mustn't fall for blah, 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 blah. And he said, no, no, no. He said, uh, this is on the level I've studied it. He hadn't studied it, but he said, this is on the level I understand what Gorbachev's doing. He did. He understood it better than his advisors. Understood this was going to lead to something enormous. Um, and of course, <laughs> there are many voices in, uh, in, the, in the Eastern Bloc who said, this is going to be a disaster. You're going the wrong way. Um, and uh, Gorbachev, of course, finally decided he had to get rid of them. So he had to get rid of everybody. His victory, and I would put this generalization at the pretty much at the end of my uh, dis discussion. His victory over his opponents was what destroyed, that is to say, his establishment of a personal dictatorship was what destroyed uh, the whole basis, the whole state apparatus. Um, but he was led by a couple of spectacularly bad ideas. One of them um, pitched by a man named Abel Aganbagian, uh, his uh, a leading economist, the person who got a Gorbachev's ear, 
1988, and unfortunately for Soviet Union, he convinced Gorbachev that uh, the main thing they had to do was get the Communist Party out of the production process, where they had party people walking around in factories, um, filling out reports on uh, factory management, get the Communist Party out of this, and leave things to the uh, workers in the factories, unleash their spontaneity as Soviet men, they're uh, itching, eager to produce more, but are held back by this bureaucratic system. A really surpassingly dopey idea. Very, very ill advised. Where did he get this notion? It comes out of uh, some kind of <laughs> naivete of so Soviet man that the Soviet worker just dying to produce. Uh, that's all he wants to do is work, work, work. Uh, <laughs> because he loves Soviet Union so much. Soviet man, you know, it doesn't matter what you pay him. He's unlike other workers in other places. What rot? What foolishness? How can anybody possibly buy this notion? He sold it to everybody. Workers don't work because they love it. They do it for the money. Do it for the wages. You want to please them? Give them more wages. Less time. More benefits something they can actually use to help their families, their children. Something material. They don't turn into Soviet men, ideology, counting more than anything else. Anyhow, this I thought this was a terrible, terrible idea, and it worked horribly. The minute they got the party out in uh, 1989, you start to see the product going down. It goes up during the early years of Peter Stroika, uh, but it goes down after Agambagian uh, did his work. Um, there he wrote his uh, brilliant, uh, all his brilliant ideas about Soviet economy translated into English, celebrated, of course, in the West. Well, anything new uh, would create a lot of excitement in the West. You can understand that. And the other horrible idea, maybe even worse, was uh, Brisk. Um, uh, Kurashvili, a um, Georgian writer, um, and uh, it's represented in his pamphlet, but in other writings, uh, uh, mainly. Uh, this, this is a pamphlet called uh, uh, Where's Russia Going? And uh, Kurashvili said uh, that we have to form national fronts in the uh, component uh, republics of the Soviet Union for Perestroika. Huh? National fronts. In other words, stir up all the subject nationalities. I don't want to say subject, but all the component nationalities, the non-Russian nationalities. And you know there are 15 republics. Stir them up um, with nationalist ideas, not Russian, not communist ideas necessarily. Well, communist in the sense that they're for uh, perestroika, uh, but perestroika meaning liberation of their country from the Soviet Union is what it comes to. So national fronts, encourage nationalism, in other words. Encourage nationalism. Abraham Lincoln being advised, encourage the Confederacy to think independently. Well, anyhow, another horrendous idea. Vladimir Putin, uh, looking back on this, said, and he's perfectly right in this, he looked back on this and he said, uh, this whole idea of the nationalities being having such a separate existence in the Soviet constitution and the idea of trying to use them, use nationalism among them against your opponents inside the Russian part of the Soviet Union, is a time bomb. That's the word he used. It's a time bomb, said Putin. He's perfectly right about that. So this is another hideous, awful idea. And this is the idea on which uh, the regime broke up. And then the third horrible idea, I think might have been my idea, as uh, espoused by <laughs> espoused by uh, Andronik Migranyan, a uh, political writer. Um, and of all things, it appeared in my book, 
which appeared at just about this time. So uh, one of the weird things <laughs> that you can't dismiss if you are in my, bo my boots here um, is that your book, which appeared in the uh, uh, middle of 1988, um, that when Migranian took up the central idea, and I guess one of the one of the main ideas in this book that I, that I wrote was that um, the people have always got to the top of the Soviet Union have been centrist. That Lenin was a kind of a centrist. That sometimes he uh, agreed with the left, sometimes he agreed with the right. He changed. There was an alternance between left and right uh, uh, in various policies, and Lenin himself did not. It wasn't man of the uh, Bukharinist right or of the um, you know, Zinoviev's left. Uh, well, actually, I, I'm i not putting that very precisely right now. I, I did put it much more precisely in the book. Uh, and uh, Stalin, too, was a man who went from left to right and, you know, centrist who made terms as the occasion uh, warranted, um, sometimes just to disarm opponents. And this, I think, uh, it actually isn't wrong to describe both Lenin and Stalin uh, and their leadership uh, styles, especially in terms of their um, their relations with their uh, their various opponents. You could say almost it was a kind of a balance of power um, outlook. Okay, that was the main argument of this book, but then Migranian took it and ran with it and said, oh, that's what Gorbachev ought to be. Gorbachev ought to be and here he is laying down the law. Oh, no, this is Link Lukashenko. This is, excuse me, I've uh, made a mistake and um, thinking I had um, a uh, Migranian, but I can see that, that I'm wrong. This is not Migranian, it's um, Lukashenko who uh, heads uh, Belarus, the Belarusian state. So um, imagine um, uh, the previous uh, picture. Imagine this man giving advice to Putin. <laughs> and he still does, by the way. He's uh, still... Uh, and he said basically the same advice he gave Gorbachev, which is the centrists always win, and you have to, and you have to um, put yourself above the leadership, and uh, and emerges. You know, um, he talked about how um, even transitions um, of uh, whole social systems can be overridden, and that's the way the capitalism came to the West through people like Cromwell, etc. Kind of a Napoleonic uh, kind of a way of applying this notion of centrism in the, uh, in the Soviet Union. At any, at any rate, he managed to sell this to Gorbachev, who started to think he was above, he even said so, started to say he was above all the factions, could bounce. That's more good Stalin stuff. Um, that never worked out for him. He should never have got thinking that way. Um, to abstract uh, his opposition so that he is adopting policy in order to defeat opposition, that's a loser. Um, he should have solved the problems and uh, used his wise solution of the problems to get the upper hand over his, over his opponents rather than starting with whatever is bad for his opponents is the policy he'll, he'll, he'll adopt. So those were three ghastly ideas uh, that were over, um, taken up by the leadership. And then uh, Gorbachev decided to uh, put all his money behind uh, um, Boris Yeltsin to come and take over the Moscow apparatus and to fight all his opponents. Terrible idea. He got this, no doubt, from um, uh, Stalin bringing Khrushchev in from the countryside and uh, making him head of the Moscow apparatus in 1949 uh, to make the Moscow apparatus a, a, a bastion uh, for Stalin. Uh, that was a bad idea then, and this was a still worse idea, and you know, putting everything on Yeltsin Terrible, terrible ideas. Um, and the result of it all, although we can't go through all the nuts and bolts of it, the events it did unfold event by event, and it needs to be understood that way. We can't properly devote the time to it uh, right now, but one thing did lead to another in the course of this thing. And I'd say that in the whole, the zeal to destroy your opponents, the a victory over your opponents in the end meant the destruction of the regime. Uh, in order to destroy the power of all those East European leaders who were against him, or a whole grouping of them, who, who were against uh, Peter Stroika, uh, in order to do that, he undermined their power, and in the end, he lost the whole Eastern Bloc. 
um, he did the same thing with the nationalities in Russia. He lost all of them. Um, so Gorbachev, in the end, he carried he carried a great victory, in the sense of a narrow, how to put it, a rise to power. But his rise to power was the fall of the state. Fall of the state. So, what's the lesson there, for us? Um, the lesson is that this transition to democracy is not any easy thing. Uh, it may it may be completely impossible. It just hasn't been demonstrated that it's possible in history. I can't point to an example of it. So it might it might be impossible. But if it is possible, it's a tremendously difficult thing that has to be done in stages. It has to be done not thinking in terms of a lot of naive stuff from the slogans uh, that have been inherited from the past about Soviet man who doesn't care about what wages he gets. Gee, ridiculous. It has to be thought out more carefully than that. There have to be a system of rewards. Look at how it's done in other states. They don't just say, you can vote on anything you want. Is there ever a vote in the United States where they say, um, you, you want the capitalist system or the socialist system? Let's have a referendum on that. Is that the character of our democracy? No. <laughs> our democracy is held in by a constitution. Our democracy is held in in a particular way. Some, some of it is wicked, in my opinion. But every democracy is held in by a constitution. So what is the constitutional framework? What is the framework of statecraft? How do you pre preserve the state through all of this? Uh, if we didn't have a state, we wouldn't be talking about democracy. <laughs> you can't have democracy if you don't have a state, if your country is falling apart. So these are the things that I think will offer us lessons if we had a discussion about it. We haven't had this discussion, but Russians ought to have this discussion about Glasnost. We ought to open up Glasnost and I say that we didn't finish the discussion about uh, the Soviet past. And what are the lessons of the past? You know, you didn't have to do anything. Just think about it. Uh, get it straight in your mind. Uh, they should do this even under Putin. Of course, Putin would never do anything like this. But maybe one day after Putin, they're going to have to take this question up. I'll have to look at the past, try to understand things in vast civics lesson on the one hand, but also a unique exploration of the historical experience of your own country. Um, things the Soviet Union did not do during this time, uh, uh, but they did, however, uh, destroy the Soviet Union for us, uh, for the globalists, and they proved the globalists right. The globalists who may have seemed to be a bunch of palookas, as far as the Soviets were concerned during this period, uh, emerged at the end of the Gorbachev years as geniuses of the first war. So the next thing we have to do is look to see uh, what happened with this newly globalized world, globalized by the subtraction of the Soviet factor, and now one world economy under one superpower. So that's the next task that we will have to take up.